U.S. Admiral in PNG on inaugural visit. As joint naval exercise begins for Australia and PNG. And a big announcement for PNG Orchids. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thanks for joining us for Wednesday's news. Commander of United States Indo-Pacific Command Admiral Philip S. Davidson made an inaugural visit to Port Moresby today. He was joined by Minister for APEC Justin Tichenko and APEC CEO Chris Hawkins for a tour around the nerve center of the Leaders' Summit in November. His visit is also to cement the agreement for the United States to provide onshore security of APEC House. After departing from Jackson's International Airport, Admiral Davidson and his team were received by the ceremonial guards at the PNG Defense Force headquarters at Murray Barracks. Davidson was then escorted down to the APEC house at Ella Beach, where he was welcomed by APEC Minister Justin Tichenko and taken into the new building for a tour. Davidson said this was his first time in Papua New Guinea. He also announced that the U.S. will provide security within the perimeters of the APEC House. I'm pleased to announce that the United States has committed to assist with inshore security for APEC through our United States Coast Guard. Our partnership with Papua New Guinea complements Australia's and New Zealand's significant contributions to the security of the summit here in Port Moresby as well. This agreement reaffirms our commitment to the region, a commitment of countless decades to date and with no end in sight, I assure you. Furthermore, it demonstrates the effectiveness of partnerships to advance common ideals and values. This U.S. provided inshore element is crucial for the overall success and security of APEC because of the coastal setting of APEC House and important transportation routes. It reflects the U.S. government's commitment not only to a successful APEC, but also to the overall safety and security of PNG and the Indo-Pacific region. As part of the inshore security package, United States Coast Guard transportable port security boats with coastal personnel will operate out of an Australian landing helicopter dock ship in cooperation with security partners from the PNG Defence Force, Australia and New Zealand Navy. During his visit, Davidson met with high-level Papua New Guinean government officials and military personnel from the PNG Defence Force and attended a closed-door meeting with the Prime Minister. Michelle Steven, National MTV News. Oil search yesterday revealed their first half results for 2018. The company has reported a net profit of 79.2 million US dollars after tax that's 39% lower than the first half of 2017. This was due in large parts to the devastating February earthquake in the Highlands. Following the 7.5 magnitude earthquake earlier this year, 2018 has no doubt been a trying year for PNG registered Oil Search Limited. However, the company revealed a solid recovery with their 2018 first half results at 79.2 million US dollars after tax. Though this is 39% lower than the company's 2017 results, owing to a 31% reduction in production and sales volumes due to a temporary shutdown of both oil search operated production and the PNG LNG project following the earthquake. Given these challenges, and they were big challenges, and the impact of some security-related incidents in PNG, the delivery of a first-half profit of 79.2 million US dollars represents, I think, a very credible, creditable achievement. Recognising it represents a drop of 39% compared to the first half of 2017. According to Botton, all production facilities are now back online, with PNG LNG presently operating above pre-earthquake levels and production from oil searches operated facilities progressively ramping up. I'm pleased to say that we've made serious progress on all our core objectives. We've aligned the PNG LNG and Papua LNG partners to a smart, efficient development concept which cooperatively develops three new LNG trains. 
as the next major investment in Papua New Guinea. These developments have the potential to almost double our LNG production over the next five years. Our focus now is to finalise negotiations of the fiscal terms for the developments with the government in Papua New Guinea. Leon Girari, National MTV News. You're at National MTV News. We go for a first break now, but on the other side, we have more of the day's other stories. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the news. Turning overseas, the blowtorch is firmly fixed on Donald Trump, who's tonight feeling unprecedented. He'd had the most damaging day of his presidency. That's after a significant double blow to Mr. Trump, which hit within hours. Two men, formerly very close to the president, pleading guilty and found guilty of fraud and violating campaign finance laws. This is likely to have a huge impact on his political future. His former lawyer now implicating the president in criminal conduct. President Trump exiting Air Force One. At the same time, his former fixer Michael Cohen leaving court in New York, having just pleaded guilty to eight felonies, including campaign finance violations for illegally making payments to silence two women who claim to have had affairs with the president. Michael, Michael, what's your message to the president? Cohen telling the court he did it at candidate Trump's direction and to influence the outcome of the 2016 election. Mr. Cohen held guilty to two campaign finance charges, one for causing an unlawful corporate contribution, and a second one for personally making an excessive personal contribution, both for the purpose of influencing the 2016 election. That contribution was to porn star Stormy Daniels, the president initially denying any knowledge of the payment made just 11 days before Americans voted. Did you know about We now know that Cohen was reimbursed by the Trump Organization. By submitting info, invoices to the candidate's company, which were untrue and false. It is a dramatic turn of events for the man who once said that he would take a bullet for the president. So the big question now is what is Michael Cohen offering prosecutors? At the exact same time, there was drama in West Virginia. The president's former campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, found guilty of five counts of tax evasion, failing to report a foreign bank account and two counts of bank fraud. The jury unable to reach a verdict on ten other charges. Mr. Manafort is disappointed of not getting acquittals all the way through or a complete hung jury on all counts. He is evaluating all of his options at this point. Paul Manafort is tonight facing 80 years in prison, and so far the president has not ruled out a pardon. It doesn't involve me, but I still feel, uh, you know, it's a very sad thing that happened. This has nothing to do with Russian collusion. This started as Russian collusion. This has absolutely nothing to do. This is a witch hunt, and it's a disgrace. But tonight is a vindication for special counsel Robert Mueller securing guilty verdicts in the first criminal trial of a Trump associate. Indictments are stacking up quickly. You have no idea how far this is going to go. In just one day, two of the president's men have fallen. Now to Iran and its relationship with the U.S. And, well, it's complicated. There's not a lot of love between the government there and Washington. But for many Iranians, it's not all death to America and great Satan stuff. Far from it. The lights still sparkle in Tehran. Sanctions be damned. Nobody here chants death to America. Rather, the design is from California, the clientele from Iran's worldly elite. Most of the Iranian people, they travel. They used to travel to America. Now with the sanctions, I'm not sure, but uh, they are fed up with the politics, yes, but with Americans, no. Take away the headscarves, add a few real cocktails, and you could be in Europe. People look up to Americans, they like Americans, and the Iranians always try to create we create like American look like food. I don't think um, they hate Americans at all. What's going to happen in the next 15 years? We don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow because every day is something new. 
here, you can't help but think Iran and America's people ought to get to know each other a little better. Don't tell that to both their leaders. Their decades of animosity on display in the ghoulish remains of the U.S. Embassy. US Embassy personnel. American diplomats were held hostage by Iran here and coups plotted by the CIA. The museum filling this top secret spy room with dummies. Yep, thank you. Just one second. Now, the Trump administration is really doing all that it can to try and drag the image of the United States here in Iran back decades to a time of espionage, subterfuge, when the United States was doing again all it possibly could to undermine or change the Iranian government. President Barack Obama, well, he saw that in the age of the iPhone there was an opportunity to improve Iran's economy and persuade its people that its future lay with the outside world. It's been better way back when, too. Jim and Gladys Strain from Riverdale, New York, first came here for their honeymoon in the 50s. The love affair is still going. People are wonderful. They're friendly, they're welcoming. Uh, they offered us roses at the airport. I mean, lovely. We're disgusted with our president. Our president is misbehaving. Across town in southern Tehran is the Iran that gets up early whose day begins long before the sun's heat. There is far less money here, but still articulate views on how the White House messes with their lives. I don't have a deep understanding, he says, but the US don't act justly. We don't count in Mr Trump's eyes. He has problems with the government, but what's my sin? The poor, the clerics who guide Iran, the young conscripts in an army whose regional grip has expanded. When we chant death to America, he says, it's the government of America. The people are respectable and we have no problem with them. I haven't fought in Iraq or Syria, but if our military hadn't gone there, we'd be fighting ISIS on the streets of Iran cities. Sanctions are already felt here. They mean less animals are slaughtered, each delivery, each lamb less profitable. I've got things to do, he says. I don't have time to chant death to America. Yet not all rising prices, like a 40% jump in housing costs they complain of here, are blamed on America. It's got nothing to do with the USA, this man says, with the government translated present. They don't provide me with my bread, they're not here. He added, the protests, like Iran has sporadically seen this year, were futile. Yet the ebb and flow of Washington and Iran's enmity make daily choices here harder. There's concern from freight drivers in Britain as hundreds of would-be migrants continue to try to store away to the UK from France. French police say their heavy presence in Calais, a major northern ferry port, is forcing migrants to target smaller towns. It happens all day, every day. A desperate scramble to get on a lorry bound for England. Tiger says he's from the Darfur region of Sudan. He spends his time risking his life, running, after moving lorries. You must try every night, you know. Yeah, maybe in the day I uh, get in a car three times. If you, they found you, they will get you out. Wistraham is a small fishing village. The beach was used in the D-Day landings, but it's the ferry to Portsmouth that docks here now. It's attracting migrants who, with Calais fortified, think this is their best chance of reaching the UK. There are 150 to 200 migrants, or between 100 and 150. It depends on the time of the year who try, no matter what the cost to get into the port, to get to the United Kingdom. As we film, this happens. Three migrants found hiding in the hull of a boat. It's causing division in the town. Naomi and Alain are angry. They say they've had to move out of the port area. I hear from people who can't take it anymore. They feel unsafe. The shops are closing little by little. The migrants are not allowed to set up camps. They sleep where they can. The police say they should seek asylum properly in France. But last year, less than 17% of asylum applications here were successful. So they're determined to get to England instead. Mostly, they'll be found at the port and released to try again tomorrow. 
The head of the London Fire Brigade has criticized reality TV show Love Island for reinforcing stereotypes of firefighters as muscle-bound men. The brigade's commissioner says the portrayals could discourage young women from joining the service. Oh, look, it's Fireman Sam! Rolling out every offensive cliché possible, that's how the most senior member of the London Fire Brigade has criticised this challenge shown during an episode of ITV's Love Island. Commissioner Danny Cotton, seen here in the middle, has urged advertisers, journalists and marketers to stop using lazy images of firefighters saying they reinforce the misconception that all firefighters are muscle-bound men and adding, no wonder so many young women are put off by that. Just 300 of London's fire brigade's 5,000 operational firefighters are women, and the comments come as the brigade launch a campaign to improve equality and gender within its organisation. I get off the truck and they go, oh, it's a fireman, and they point at me. And then they're like, uh, no, not a fireman, I don't know what to call you. And so I've had fireman lady, I've had fire lady, fire person. But some people would argue that this is just entertainment. Yes, they would, but as with any sort of entertainment, you have to be careful about the stereotype that you are portraying, and that is not the stereotype. That is not what happens in real life. Hi. We're checking all the smoke alarms on the street. But it's not just TV programmes causing concern. Adverts which have appeared on our screens over the years like these have been criticised as reinforcing gender stereotypes. The reason it's harmful is because it limits the opportunities and potential of people, sometimes very young people. Um, it, it stops them wanting to grow up to do certain roles and that brings costs to them, themselves, uh, to society and to the economy as well. And for Danny Cotton, the first female to hold the London Fire Brigade's most senior post, she's hoping a different portrayal of firefighters will help dispel the idea that the service is a very masculine environment and a sexist field. Women have stolen the show at this year's MTV Music Awards. Jennifer Lopez receiving a Lifetime Achievement Award right after the superstar dazzled the crowd with a medley of her greatest hits. There was also a special tribute to the Queen of Soul, Aretha Franklin. A room of stars honoring one who has fallen. Undisputed Queen of Soul tonight, remembered by some of those she inspired. Aretha Louise Franklin changed the course of my life, and I know she influenced so many people in this house tonight. And I want to thank you, Aretha, for empowering all of us. R E S P E C T. This year's Video Vanguard Award for Lifetime Achievement went to Jennifer Lopez. This is really like a tremendous honour for me. It has been an incredible journey. She's the first Latina to ever receive the title and wowed the audience with a lengthy medley of her greatest hits. With her partner and kids watching, the singer also took home the award for best collaboration. It was also a successful night for Camila Cabello, winning two awards including Artist of the Year. I can't believe this is for me, thank you so much. And rapper Cardi B nominated in 10 categories and taking home best new artist. It was her first major appearance since having her baby last month. I had a baby, I carry the baby and now I'm still winning awards. Combined with some powerhouse performances from Nicki Minaj and Ariana Grande. I it was certainly women that stole this year's show. This is Wednesday's news. Stay tuned for more stories after the break. Welcome back to the news. Papua New Guinea's Defence Force, with the support of the Royal Australian Navy, began Exercise Paradise off the coast of Fairfax Harbour today. The operations were conducted from HGM PNGS Lakikamu and controlled by PNGDF's Director Maritime Corporation Commander Willy Gallia. The two-week exercise is focused on maritime security for the APEC Leaders Summit in November. The day began with a safety briefing from the crews of the Australian petrol boats before departure from Langkrong Base to HMPNGS Lakekamu. 
invited guests to witness the exercise by PNGDF personnel, Deputy Secretary Simon Tunapai and Chief of Force Operation Colonel Siale Diro. Today's exercise comprised of two scenarios, denying contingency, which involved a fishing boat coming too close to restricted zones, and increased threat, which involved a vessel with intent that was not desirable towards the areas that were being protected. The focus for the last couple of years, and indeed this year especially, for Exercise Paradise, has been our preparations uh, for, to support uh, APEC uh, this year and especially the Leaders Summit in November. So Exercise Paradise this year uh, uh, has been centered here at Fairfax Harbour and its purpose has been to test our preparations to support APEC uh, during the Leaders Summit in November. Exercise Paradise is a bilateral maritime engagement between Papua New Guinea and Australia's maritime elements. Royal Austra Australian Navy personnel, Commander John Cowan, said the aim of the exercise was to strengthen bilateral relationships and interoperability between the navies in the areas of maritime, surveillance and security. That we develop between our navies and the professionalism that we, we enhance between our sailors and our officers is absolutely vital, should be, we be required to operate in, an, uh, in some future operation. Can I say that the uh, PNG Defence Force Maritime Element has shown itself to be a very, very capable organization and certainly I think well prepared uh, to meet the challenges ahead, be that Exercise Paradise is being conducted in preparation for maritime security during the APEC Leaders Summit. The exercise will continue next week. Charlene Airy, National MTV News. Lay police boss Anthony Wagambi Jr. is urging lay residents to stop buying products from street vendors in the city. This follows an increased number of street vendors as well as petty crimes. Mr. Wagambi said police presence will be increased at the main bus stops to deal with this. The Mobile Squad 13 will be engaged in this operation, assisting the Footbeat unit, which currently covers the Eriku Town Market and other crowded areas. You at National MTV News, Chukai Sport is next. Don't go away. Tukai Sports. Welcome to Tukai Sports. The PNG RFL announced a new chairperson and head coach for the National Women's Rugby League team today. Ruth Warham was named chair lady of the new PNG Orchids Executive Management Committee, while David Wesley was named head coach of the All Search PNG Orchids. So part of one of our Ruth Warham, a prominent media personality in the country, was appointed chair lady for the newly established PNG Orchids Executive Management Committee. The PNG Orchids EMC will help assist the PNG RFL board and the Oil Search PNG Orchids prepare to participate in international fixtures. Uh, she is a passionate rugby league fan. She's worked with the PNG RFL over the last 18 months in uh, various rugby league programs, including the delivery of the Rugby League World Cup in PNG, which was a successful event hosted here at the World Search National uh, Football Stadium. We believe appointing Ruth, who is one of our prominent women in PNG, to head this program, inaugural program, actually uh, is in line with our emphasis on gender participation and equal participation in the sport by women, both as players members of the board and as part of our management group going forward. With the new PNG OEMC, this will help develop the women's game. Waram says this can also be used to empower women in the country. So part of one of our aims as the new committee and with the support of the board is to um, pull together a team that, you know, not only the, it's the support and the um, backing from a corporate sponsor like Oil Surge, 
and other like-minded companies that we expect to uh, join us to uh, run this program is going to be a big boost for women's uh, development in this country, not only through the rugby, sports of rugby league, uh, but in terms of using the code to empower our women and also using that platform to, uh, to um, communicate messages of uh, support and of empowering our women in this country. Newly appointed head coach of the national women's team and former Canberra Raider and Kumul David Wesley will lead the Oil Search PNG Orchids. Wesley was part of the Orchids as the assistant coach at last year's Rugby League World Cup and is not a new face to women's rugby in the country. Really enjoyed myself being a part of the women's game so far um, in Papua New Guinea. I've been, I've been, been, been involved in uh, development in PNG uh, in Australia through rugby league and, and girls playing at a young age so um, I think I'm the right fit um, as being part of the game um, especially uh, the girls game being only new here I think it's going to take a lot of hard work especially uh, at the junior level and with our schools and, and, and growing the game together. Wesley's first task will be to select players from the women's national championships which will be played this weekend at the National Football Stadium. The selected players will be named on the 27th of August where they will start preparations for their first match against the Brisbane Broncos NRL women's team. The Oil Search Orchids will travel to Brisbane, Australia before the match on Sunday at 1.30pm at Suncorp Stadium. The match will be televised live on your number one to watch and TV. Elijah Levet, National and TV Sports. 13 SP Hunters players received attainment certificates from St. John's Ambulance today. These players learned first aid drills taught by first aid officers from St. John's Commissioner. These 13 players are now equipped with knowledge of how to perform different first aid drills. When a medical emergency strikes, minutes matter. Immediate intervention by people like yourselves who have been trained in St. John's first aid proven to save a life, reduce disability and help the doctors treat the patient when they arrive at the hospital. Kenan congratulated the players on completing the different first aid exercises and receiving their certificates from St. John's Ambulance. Charlie Simon. I just want to say well done and congratulations. It's a privilege to have you joining our family of St. John first aiders all around the world and all here in Papua New Guinea. PNG Rugby Football League CEO Rieta Rao thanks St. John's Ambulance for this partnership and says it is something that will continue over the years. The sport of Rugby League is a very strong platform uh, and you have also recognized that and as we partner together hopefully it will go a long way and I'm sure, I'm sure it will go a long way every person, every, every player who gets a certificate today uh, in their own individual walk of life, their families and the community which they will engage in in the coming days. With rugby league being a body contact sport, it is important for players to learn first aid in case of on-field emergencies. These 13 players can now be able to perform first aid on the field of play if any emergency cases may arise in a match. Elijah Lovett, National MTV Sports. The ITI Junior Tennis Competition ended on a high note yesterday in Port Moresby with the awarding of medals and trophy presentations. ITI Marketing Manager Sammy Rose Javilano says as part of ITI's community obligation, it will continue to support the development of tennis in Papua New Guinea. Since the revival of Junior Tennis Development Program, which has been backed by ITI, interest in the sport has grown, with a lot of young tennis enthusiasts taking part in various divisions. Successfully ending the Junior Tennis Competition on Sunday, ITI Marketing Manager Semi Rose Javilona says supporting the development of young tennis stars in PNG is a way forward to producing future national tennis superstars. ITI is very grateful, you know, seeing those kids like uh, they're under eight, uh, like um, they know nothing about uh, tennis and then when they start to know it, 
uh, they uh, they are very enjoying uh, they enjoy really uh, playing of it uh, of course with the guidance of coach Kualam, uh who is uh, the coach and uh, he, he put this as initiative to put up this ITI junior tennis and also the parents as well are very happy uh, you know enjoying watching their kids playing she says on the positive side, players from yesterday's event will move to a higher level and will be closely followed. So they will be uh, proceeding to our next tournament, uh, which will come like at, uh, two to three months from now. And uh, they, they will be on leveling up. I think there will be an upgrading. And yeah, uh, with the uh, coach uh, Qualam and uh, the tennis director, Eddie Mera, they are the one organizing it and, uh, you know, and go to the next level or leveling up until they reach the highest peak which will you know we don't know if they will become you know a good athlete or someone who will represent PNG soon or uh, yeah we are looking forward on it. Tennis is not the only sport ITI is supporting as it also looks at a variety of other sporting codes. Uh, ITI is giving back uh, to the community by way of sponsoring in sports. So uh, just to name a few, uh, we've been sponsoring uh, like cricket, uh, snooker, uh, volleyball, uh, football and uh, this ITI Junior Tennis. Uh, they develop the tennis skills, which will eventually uh, 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 a benefit for them uh, in order for them to become a good tennis adult player someday as they grow old. Godwin Eki, National MTV Sports. Sugar Sports continues with more after these messages. Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back to Shukai Sports. With a poor performance in the 2017 Women's Rugby League World Cup, newly appointed All Search PNG Orchids coach David Wesley says his main aim is to improve on 2017's poor performance. With the Oil Search PNG Orchids scheduled to play the Brisbane Broncos National Rugby League women's team on September the 2nd, newly appointed coach David Wesley will be focusing on improving some of the team's upsets in last year's poor performance in the Women's Rugby League World Cup. Especially our defence. Um, there's no doubt our women have uh, um, don't take a backward step and we just go all out there, but just, just the structure and, and the technical skills um, that we really need to work in. Um, um, that's that's what we're going to be doing again in our camp. Wesley said he will be working with selectors to pick the team during this weekend's Women's Regional Confederate Trials in Port Mosby with the team announcement on Monday. Number one is uh, you've got to be able to tackle, so defence is really important. Um, we can't go having 50 points scored against us. Um, and I like players that just keep working. Um, you can't just have your run and just sit back and wait for the next run. He said he will be considering bringing overseas-based women in for a test against the Jelarus in October, but at the moment he will be selecting 22 women from the trials for next weekend's match. Certainly we have some PNG girls living in Australia that are good players as well. Uh, just like the Kumuls, we've got to get that uh, mixture um, of experience and, and young talent and, you know, the older girls. So that's what we're trying to, we're trying to build a team with, to actually, you know, win games. So. He said they will be looking to put a strong team together with their main goal to score a win. Uh, we've only got a week to prepare them for this game and we'll do the best we can but we're not there to lose either. There's, there's, the girls want to win, the coaching staff want to win and you know the country want to see them winning but this is a start and we're, we're building towards the next World Cup. Fidel Sukina, National MTV Sports. From a humble farming family to Auckland's Mount Albert Grammar School and then the All Blacks, Jack Goodhue's journey has been inspiring to say the least. At 23, he's already won two Super Rugby titles with the Crusaders and is now in line to play his first Bledisloe Cup decider at Eden Park. Two tests in and Jack Goodhue is looking like one of the special ones. He wasn't overthinking things, he just did what was obvious to him and, and that doesn't just happen, it comes through a lot of hard work behind the scenes. Hard work that started not in Northland or Canterbury, but Auckland. He's a star for Northland, the Crusaders and the All Blacks, but it was right here at Mount Albert Grammar where Goodhue's talents really started to come through. 
Jack and twin brother Josh are four of two Goodhue brothers who boarded at Mags. Jack was head boy. His first 15 coach, Jeff Moon, saw a rare focus. Schoolwork always came first. He was invited to New Zealand Sevens training when he was at school and uh, he, first time he declined it because he had to complete an assignment. Uh, he was in the Blues schools team. Dad up north injured his back and called the boys up to milk the cows. So he uh, never went to Blues camp. He went farming for two weeks. It seems leaving Northland and the farm was harder than many thought. You know, coming from a farm, he came to us Tammy and I and said, we, we, I need silver top milk. And I said, oh, we can't get that. Well, he rang them up, you know, and he'd write letters to them and he would find that, yes, you could get it, you know. And so within a, within a week, if I didn't have it, well, he'd be knocking on the door saying, sir, I asked you about this, you know, here it is. His legacy is clear for all to see here. The boarding house's first ever All Black. Behind the dining hall in a garage slash gym fitted out by students, Jack is again there for motivation. Hard to believe he was overlooked for the New Zealand schools team. Might not have been the most talented guy out there on the park, but you know, I've always known something I can control is my work rate, so I'm just focused on that a lot of the time. A formula that's brought him plenty of success and one that makes him a popular choice for the All Blacks moving forward. There is always an extra edge when provinces from the same region go head to head for the Runfilly Shield. Chuck in a player that swapped sides, the unexpected addition of an All Black, and you've got all the makings of a classic when holders Taranaki take on Manuatu. It's hard to imagine Manuatu could be any more fired up for their Friday night clash. We consider them pretty big rivals, I guess. Um, they've sort of. It's been a couple of years since we've beaten them, so I don't know if they, they see us as rivals at the moment, but um, we'll try, try to look to instill that again. In Kitty Kitty's first season as captain, the Turbos got their season off to a near-perfect start, with a come-from-behind win over Waikato. Near-perfect because lock forward Liam Hallam Eames was subsequently handed a four-game ban for this incident in the very first minute. He misjudged that one, and, and we're probably lucky we didn't lose him in that first minute for a red card. He really let the team down there, so um, he's got four weeks to think about that and fix it. But um, we've got players that can slot in and, and fill his spot for now. That player is likely to be former Taranaki lock Brad Tucker, who would be making his first Mitre 10 start in green and white. And in a bizarre twist, the Waikato player who was struck by Hallam Eames just happened to be Brad's brother, James. Did that lead to any bit of a, a discussion within camp? Or no? uh, oh, obviously, it's been brought up, um, but always a light harder. There's certainly no bad blood anywhere there, and uh, my brother definitely knows it's all part of rugby. Tucker, who less than 12 months ago helped Taranaki lift the Ranfurly Shield off Canterbury, has no issue trying to strip it back off them. No, I couldn't have asked for a better sort of scene to be set, so I'm obviously pretty excited and look to get one back on them and obviously wrestle the shield back over here. It's almost 40 years to the day since Manawatu last held the Ranfurly Shield, but on top of the confidence last weekend's result has given them, there's even more good news for those in green and white, with all black Nehim on the Scudder still in camp. Seemingly surplus to Steve Hansen's requirements for at least one more week. To basketball now, another preseason is officially underway for the New Zealand Breakers, but one with a vastly different feel to the past. The four-time NBL champions are embarking on another season, but this one with fresh faces everywhere. A new coach, new players and a new style of play. This is the Breakers like you've never seen them before. If this corner is empty right here, it's fine. Just four players have returned from last season making this a step into the relative unknown. It's exciting, you know, and obviously a bit of change at the club, but um, I think everyone's brought in uh, some great energy and i um, excited to you know, start a, start a new season with um, some new faces and, and really get after it. But while it's a new look with a more offensive game plan, some elements will remain the same. You don't want to change too much, I mean, especially like the culture, uh, you know, and you know, the, the, the values that the club stands for, uh, you never want to change that. There's the expectation is, you know, we win here. Their pre-season started in earnest with a gruelling fitness test yesterday. Today they were in at 4am for the first of two training sessions. A ruthless start for the imports who only arrived on Monday. It actually went well, man. The whole team, you know, did well in it, passed it. So, I mean, it, 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 was, really, it was really fun to, to kind of get it out of the way. 
Now that it is out of the way, they're turning attentions to honing that new game plan, and with it, they're promising excitement. We think we've put together a good team that actually can play fast, play smart, and put a lot of points on the, on the board. Two days into a fresh start, seven weeks to find the perfect formula before the season begins. And that ends Shukai Sports up next with the details for the next 24 hours. Shukai Sports. True Kai Sports. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. A look at the weather forecast in the southern region cloudy periods in Port Moresby and Kerama. Rain drizzles in Popandita and mostly fine in Daru and Alital. In the Mombasa region, rain showers in Leh, Medang, Wewak and Vanimo and some rain, although cloudy, in Wau. In the New Guinea Islands region, rain showers in Loringa and Kaving, a shower or two in Kokopo, Rabaul and Kimbe and fine weather in Buka. And in the Highlands region, rain drizzles, then morning fog in all centres. Forecast for small ships, there is renewal strong wind warning for all coastal waters. Strong southeast winds of 25 to 34 knots are expected to continue for the next 24 hours, causing rough seas. All small crafts and boats are advised to take necessary precautions before and after going out to sea during this period. Forecast for small ships for the next 24 hours. Waters of southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres Strait and Daru. Tekiwai Island to Hood Point to Samurai Island. Seas of 1 to 1.5 meters. Waters of eastern and western Milne Islands with waters of Samurai Island to Finchafen with waters of Long Island to Medang to Bogia, Wewak, Aitape to Vanimo and northern PNG Indonesian border, seas of 1.5 to 2.5 meters. Waters of Finchafen through Vitias and Dampier Straits to CSC Islands and Long Island, seas of 2 to 3 meters. Waters of Manus and its western group of islands, seas of 0.5 to 1.3 meters. Waters of New Island to East New Britain to North Bougainville, seas of 0.5 to 1.3 meters. And waters of West New Britain to South Bougainville, seas of 1.5 to, to 1.3 meters. Ocean forecast for PNG areas in the Coral Sea seas moderate with southeast winds at 15 to 20 knots. In the Solomon Sea seas rough with southeast winds at 25 to 34 knots. In the Bismarck Sea seas rough with southeast winds at 25 to 34 knots. And in the Pacific Ocean seas slight with southeast winds at 10 to 15 knots. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. And before we go, the Malahang Police Post Rehabilitation Project for Ahi Local Level Government in Leh was officially signed this morning. The partnership is between International Terminal Container Services Incorporation, Ahi Investment and Leh District Office. The groundbreaking ceremony of the Malang Police Post in Leh was launched in February this year. During the same time, two new police vehicles were given by the ICTSI, costing 200,000 kina. However, the construction of the police post was delayed due to changes made to the design. The initial construction cost of the building was 250,000 kina. Did some recalculation. They requested for to increase the project cost to 400,000 kina, so it was easily approved by our boss. 
because uh, really peace and order situation is, is really important for the economy to grow, for more locators to come in and for to, to provide safety to, to, the to the community. ICTSA is the company that signed a 25-year agreement with the PNG government for the operation, management and development of the country's international ports including Lay Tidal Basin. ICTSI has partnered with IE Investment Limited, a shareholder of Lay-based stevedoring company, Rybex Stevedore, whose function was taken over by ICTSI. The partnership program between IE Investment, ICTSI and Lay District is focusing on addressing law and order issues in the communities. Hopefully with the signing um, this morning um, and getting that formality out of the way, we should have the funds available and the construction work at the site should hopefully begin um, before end of this month. The recent changes to the design of the Malang Police Post will include a cell block and a family and sexual violence unit. This resulted in the increase of the initial cost of the building from 250,000 kina to 400,000 kina. The patron for Family and Sexual Violence Action Committee and the member for Lay, John Rosso, says the district is planning to build a cell block and a FSV unit at all police posts in Lay. I have a very good metropolitan commander and he uh, shares the same uh, sentiments with me on that. And Malahang will be one of the first to start apart from the lay police station. So in our bid we'll try to uh, assist them, ensure that we have an FSV office in each, each police station in lay. Julie Badui Owa, National MTV News, lay. Now here's a recap of tonight's main stories. U.S. Admiral and PNG on inaugural visit. Joint Australia PNG Naval Training Operation Exercise Paradise 2018 gets underway. And big announcement for PNG Orchids. And that's news port and weather for today, Wednesday, the 22nd of August 2018. On behalf of the entire MTV News team, pleasant viewing and good night.